Side. The only way we're going to win this war is we can stop the British from getting all the supplies. So we're going to have to start sinking everything the Germans decide. You all following me? If we do that, we're bound to sink another ship and kill some Americans. So if we do that, the Americans are going to want to fight us. That's a problem. So how do we stop that? I know the Americans have a natural enemy. You know where? In Mexico. Because the Americans and the Mexicans fought a war in 1846. And the Americans stole half of Mexico. They got California and New Mexico and Arizona and Texas. They got all this land from Mexico. I know the Mexicans would love to have that land back. So, the foreign officer, Zimmerman, sent a telegram to Mexico saying, look, we're going to be sinking a whole bunch of American ships. When we do that, they're going to go to war with us. So why don't you guys invade America and you can have all that land and we'll give you lots of money to help you out. Problem, the British intercept this telegram give it to the Americans. So now the Americans know the Germans are planning all this terrible stuff. By the way, we're only 90% sure that they really did this. It's possible it was made up by the British, but we'll never know for sure. Well, maybe we'll know, but I don't see it right now. The point is irrelevant, though, because what matters is that in February of 1917, the United States of America says enough is enough, and they go to war against Germany. Now, what you need to understand is that even though the Yanks are coming, they ain't that big of a deal. Honestly, what you Americans need to remember is that you haven't always been a superpower. That in 1917, your army is smaller than Italy's army. In addition, you've got to cross a heck of a big ocean to get there. So the Germans aren't out of it yet, believe me. Americans are not going to win this war right away. And it's even worse, because the Russians are in a revolution. Remember that Russia is on the United States' side. So, the United States says, we're in! And then the Russians say, well, we're out. Not because of anything doing with us. They have a revolution. Notice that there are two revolutions. A lot of people get this messed up. There's two of them. The second one, with Lenin and the communists, doesn't happen for several months. The first revolution is in March. They, there's bread riots in St. Petersburg. They're running out of food. And they capture the Tsar in a train. And they say, here, you need to quit. And the Tsar says, OK, I'm going to quit. They do not set up a communist government. They set up a temporary government. Why is that a problem? Because the war is very unpopular. The Germans know, aha, this is our point. Our, this is our chance. Just as the British sent Lawrence to the Ottoman Empire to get rid of them. The Germans send Lenin, who has been hiding in Switzerland all this time. The Germans send Lenin to Russia to do the same thing, and he does. Lenin goes around St. Petersburg talking to his Bolshevik friends, the Bolsheviks are communists, and convincing them that this new government is not any kind of government we should approve of. We need to set up a communist government. We need to get rid of this democratic provisional government and install a communist government. And he does that in November of 1917. Okay? Quick thing on calendars. Might as well confuse you. What the heck? Is it the March Revolution or the April Revolution? And the answer is yes. Uh -huh. Is it the November Revolution or the October Revolution? The answer is yes. Why? Because the Russians use a different calendar. They use the Gregorian calendar. We use the Julian calendar. Their calendar is two weeks behind ours. So if you're reading your book and they're talking about the April Revolution, don't be worried, as long as they're also talking about the October Revolution. The Russians call it the October Revolution. We call it the November Revolution. When are you making a mistake? When you say the March Revolution and the October Revolution. Or if you say the April Revolution and the November Revolution, then you're mixing your calendars up. If it's March, it's also November. If it's April, it's also October. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. But again, go ahead, Nick. The problem for the Americans, and especially for the French, is what do you think Lenin does when he takes over. He surrenders to the Germans. It's called the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Litovsk. B-R-E-S-T. This is a town in Russia. B-R-E-S-T-L-I-T-V-O-S-K. Brest-Litovsk. 
It's Russia's surrender to the Germans. Why are they doing it? Two reasons. One, guess what? Lenin promised. When the Germans said, hey, we'll get you to Russia, okay, but you better surrender once you take over. Okay. And the other reason Lenin had to do it was because this is the beginning of the Russian Revolution. It's not the end. Lenin takes over. Yay, I'm going to set up a communist country. The workers of the world will get, take all the factories over. They will get rid of all of the rich farmers and give the land to the poor farmers. But all of the capitalists in Russia are going to say no way. And so this begins a huge civil war in Russia. Russia is out of the war because they're fighting amongst themselves now for the next three or four years. So Lenin says, I can't fight. We can't fight each other and the Germans. And so he surrenders and gives all of this land to Germany. All that land goes to Germany. Germany's like, yes! But they're more excited because they think all these soldiers that were in Russia, bring them to France. It's a one-front war now, not two-front. Germany's extremely excited. It's strange as the Russians who surrendered, not the French. So that kind of skewed the whole Vodge life and plan, but that doesn't matter. Now we'll finish off the French because there's so many more of us. And we got these fast trains to get them over there. The Americans, meanwhile, are only slowly coming across on boats. Yes? They do get, uh, Russia gets its property back, right? Later? Eventually, yes. Okay, kind of. You'll see. Okay. So the Americans are coming over, but they're coming over slowly. The Germans are pressing again. They can again smell the croissants in Paris. Because the French are like, holy crap, here come more Germans. Oh my god. So we don't know what's going to happen, Nick, please. Meanwhile, but another thing that changed because of the war is technology. When you look at World War I, you see all kinds of funny pictures like this screwy looking tank. The British tank is even more funny looking. Okay? What you see in World War I. It's the ultimate transition. Everything in the world changes, including warfare. World War I is the last war where they're still riding horses, for example. And even though they have tanks, they haven't yet figured out how to use them well. The tanks don't make a big difference. In World War II, they've learned how to use the tanks. That's why World War II is so different from World War I. Not only the tanks, you get all kinds of changes, some more important than others. The U-boats is the biggest change as far as being used well. What is a U-boat? Why U-boat? U is German for, or it's the first letter in Untersee. Untersee is German for under the water. All a U-boat is is an underwater boat. Untersee boat. All right? And the effectiveness, Nick, of these U-boats can be seen when you see how many ships that they sank around the coasts of France and England. One of those dots is, of course, Lusitania. Other inventions, like the airplane. Again, it didn't make a big deal. You know how you dropped an, a bomb from an airplane in World War I? By hand. Literally. Okay? It's nothing like what you see in World War II. The airplanes are used more for scouting than anything else. You get dog fights in between, you know, uh, the planes, the Snoopy and the Red Baron and that kind of stuff. But it doesn't really make any kind of a major difference in the war. Other things that they use, things like flamethrowers, grenade launchers, not a major difference. Um, the most interesting of all of the weapons they use, the poison gas, the reason it's interesting there is it's the only time in a major war it's ever been used, before or since. A couple of reasons for that. One, the trouble with poison gas is that if the wind changes direction, you just gassed yourself. Two, it was so nasty. I mean, your blood literally all of a sudden completely clotting on you, okay? And, and so, just such a horrible way to die that after World War I was over, countries all around the world said, you know what, we just shouldn't do this. And everybody agreed not to use poison gas. It's only been used once since then by Saddam Hussein in Iraq against his own people. Now, the machine gun, we know, is not new. It was used in Africa beforehand, but we know it's become pretty much the weapon of choice in World War I, as we saw on our quiet on the Western Front. Um, perhaps the strangest thing about that is the 1918 influenza epidemic. An epidemic is the wrong word. The notice it says pandemic. What's a pandemic? It's a worldwide epidemic. This was the worst outbreak of the flu ever in history. You may remember when we were talking about the uh, H1N1, just actually it's, they still got the vaccines, they're still talking about it now. And maybe it'll be worse next year. 
everybody was comparing it to this year. Why was this flu such a big deal? 